Hastings, Editor of International Advisor. And joining me is RL360 Chief Executive David Nichol. Hi, David. Hi, good morning. The way in which you and I are doing this interview really goes to show the, the strange circumstances in which we find ourselves. I mean, we're now in week eight of lockdown in the UK, um, and things don't really seem to be changing at all, at least in the near term. Do you have any sort of idea or thoughts about what this means for the life insurance industry moving forward, say, over the next three, six or, or 12 months? There are different answers for different time frames, Kirsten. Over the next three months, we're actually fairly sanguine, if that's the right word. I mean, it's been a traumatic few weeks uh, restructuring the company for the lockdown age. but what has become apparent is how resilient a lot of the life companies are a lot of their income is recurring income a lot of the business they do is very long-term business so in the short term uh, i think the life industry is actually in a very good place compared to some industries we still have income uh, we're able to look after our staff and we're able to offer a service so in the very short term it's actually turned out and I'm slightly surprised by how well it has. It's turned out fairly well for the industry, I think. Over the medium term, it's probably a bit more confused because a lot depends on how long this whole lockdown situation lasts. There will come a time, I think, when it does get a bit more difficult to write new business, where some advisors are struggling to expand their portfolios. And in that environment, I think, that the, the situation is a bit more mixed uh, if the lockdown goes on for a very long time. In the long term, beyond 12 months, I'm actually very optimistic. And we've already had signs of this. In an uncertain world, um, people want to save. They need to put money aside for a rainy day. And that's really been proven over recent weeks. They want their money in a safe place, a safe harbour, if it isn't already in that. So we're finding that a lot of money is actually moving to the Isle of Man. Now, we can't speak for everyone, but we do see quite a lot of movement that gives us quite a lot of confidence for the future. So I'm actually uh, surprised by how sanguine I am for the very short term and extremely positive for the very long term. It's that middle ground if the lockdown goes on in different countries in different ways that I'm not quite sure how it'll pan out. And geographically, RL360 is spread across a lot of pockets in the world. Are there any that are giving you more confidence than others or, or vice versa? It's fairly evenly spread. I mean, we don't really have a lot of uh, historical context to go on for anything like that. So maybe the uh, financial crisis uh, 10 years ago or so, but that's a different type of situation. So here, the business we're getting is broadly spread. Uh, from around the world uh, and I think uh, it's it's impossible really to analyze that at the moment I think it'll take a few more months to really understand what what that actually means for us or or for the industry in general but at the moment our new business levels are holding up surprisingly well um, we're averaging over the year about 85 percent of target which is a bit of a surprise to me um, but a good one uh, and um, it's it's geographically spread. So over the past eight weeks, what do you think has been the biggest challenge that life companies have faced? The first few days were fascinating, or the week leading up to lockdown, because we were all a bit sort of, how's this going to work and what do we do? So I guess we, like some other companies, I imagine, we had a few moments where we weren't quite sure how to tackle it. But as usual, the sort of operating people, the customer services, IT operations, uh, people kick in and everything starts to happen. So the biggest challenge was changing our oper target operating model. We have gone, or we went in a period of 10 days from being uh, 350 people, all who work from an office, to um, an entirely home-based company about five people still going into the office on the Isle of Man, a couple to uh, do the post because we operate central scanning and a couple of IT people and one sort of office manager. And that was it. And we restructured our investment dealing processes, customer service processes, um, 
staff communication methods, uh, everything within 10 days. And so that was a huge operational challenge, not just for us, I imagine for lots of large companies. But what's impressed me is how we managed to get it done. I mean, we are up and running, we were up and running, doing all our investment dealing, new business processes, governance, everything from home within 10 days. And our governance standards have not slipped at all. And the lesson I think is now you know what it's like. To, why can't companies, large companies, act at this pace more often? Now, there's a lesson for us is that there are things we could do more quickly and more robustly. But the challenge of recreating our target operating model that would satisfy governance, satisfy advisors and their customers in 10 days, I thought was extraordinary. Not taking any personal credit, but for all the operational people who made it happen, I think it's uh, something they will always be proud of, and I know they are. This um, move to technology, if this had happened even three or five years ago, we would not, I, I believe, been able to have moved and transitioned to a home-based working environment quite so easily. Do you get the sense that we're going to keep this rush to technology, or is it something that perhaps is going to fade away a little bit as people get back to meeting face to face? I think we'll move into a hybrid model. I doubt now there will ever be a 100% office-based company again. I doubt it. Uh, it's now proven that we can be more flexible uh, to accommodate people. We'll have to see how it goes. And we definitely, though, will have an office-based environment, but it's whether it can be more flexible on how to work it. You're absolutely right. I don't think we could have done this five years ago, but companies have survived disasters and situations before and survived. So you just operate in the technological world in which you exist. So we would have done different things, maybe telephoned each other all the time or something, but we would have survived. And, uh, but I think the technological things we have put in place, most of which we'll keep. So we've gone digital signature. Uh, we have, um, we've put all our commission processes online. Um, those are just two examples. Uh, we've made all our documentation PDF based so that um, advisors can go online to amend them. I mean, there's a whole host of things we've done, which I think we'll never retreat from now we've done them. Most of them are good things. Most of them we would have done anyway at some stage in the future. We just got on with it and made it happen because we had no choice. Some of these innovations are like digital signatures are very helpful for financial advisors when it comes to writing new business and keeping in contact with clients and with the, the life insurers. Are there any particular queries that you're getting either from advisors or clients I mean, over the course of the past few weeks about what they should be doing or what their options are? Surprisingly few uh, of any sort of esoteric nature. Most of the advisors we talk to, they just want us to be there and to be operating and to be contactable and for our systems to work pretty much the same as before, except now more technologi technologically based. Um, we don't find we're getting lots of very complicated questions. They just want to know we're going to do the basics well and be there for them. Uh, you do get the occasional question. We, we, some advisors need more education than others in, in the use of technology. Same as all walks of life. Advisors are no different to other types of uh, human beings in that regard. Some embrace it very quickly and very well, some less so. So we have some advisors who, who've needed more handholding in the use of technology. Uh, we still have our relationship managers in place and the account managers on the Isle of Man, so they can talk to anybody they want when they want, just as they normally would. They're all uh, available. Uh, a lot of them are, are on their own. Some advisors work on their own. And so uh, I find, or we have found that they appreciate uh, interaction quite a lot if they're stuck at home. So the sort of Zoom call we're having now, we're finding happens a lot between ourselves and advisors. Uh, whether it be informal Zoom calls or telephone calls or conversations one-to-one -one or more formal, so we can't do face-to-face -face training, for example. So Neil Chadwick, who a lot of advisors and, and uh, international advisor, you'll know him as well. He's been providing lots of technical and tax training by Zoom, up to 
50, 60, 70 advisors at a time, for example. Uh, we've been conducting uh, seminars with fund managers, recent one with BlackRock, where we've been getting up to 80, 90 advisors at a time signing up for uh, those sorts of conversations. So I think it's a mixture of be there, do the basics well, uh, be someone that the advisors can rely on. And then the other things like the technical training and the fund management conversations to make life a bit better, keep people up to date, those sorts of things. But it's all quite basic. People want the basic things done well. There have, there have been a, a staggering number of deaths in the UK. We're talking 30,000 plus. That's 30,000 people who have paid into a pension, who have assets, who have homes, who have loved ones, who, who now unfortunately have beneficiaries. And that's a lot to process for an individual, but also for an advisor. So what sorts of conversations would you suggest that financial advisors have with clients now, but also moving forward to put themselves in the best position for the security of themselves and their families? I think it's about uh, planning for an uncertain future. Uh, you talk of the sad amount of deaths that have taken place around the world, also in the United Kingdom. Um, and the proof of our role in, in that environment is that we have been in a position where we can pay out funds to people should they need it if they have sadly died or to their um, families, etc. So we are in a situation where we have been doing that. I don't want to get into numbers, but we have been there for that situation. So I think advisors, uh, and the, the advisors don't need advice from me on how they go about their business, but I would have thought that the opportunity is helping clients understand how to cope with uncertainty, how to plan for uncertainty in their retirement. They may be losing their job. They may have to go, particularly in our sector of this industry, from one country to another. So their funds have to be portable. They may want it in a safe place. So advisors, and they are already doing this, by the way, we can see this from the sorts of business volumes we're getting, are talking to their clients about those sorts of situations. How do you save in a way that you can cope with an uncertain world? More and more people are going to want to save, I believe. There will be probably slightly less money in the world going around, but for those who maintain a job and are earning well, they will want to plan for their families to cope with uncertainty. And that's exactly where a financial advisor sits in the spectrum, I believe, of what's going on in the world. So there's plenty of opportunity for good advisors to help clients in uncertainty. We've touched on both the, the life insurance sector and also the financial advisory space. Is there anything that you think that the government could be doing to support the industry, financial services more broadly, or those two sectors specifically through this time? Is there anything else that they could be doing to support you? Well, in fact, uh, the Alaman government has asked me a similar question, and I'm sure others, not just me, uh, in the last couple of weeks. Given the nature of our business and the fact we are so international, and a lot of our business is so long term, uh, the short term things that a government could do are not really my concern. We don't need help. Um, we haven't furloughed any staff. We have kept all staff on the books. They're all being fully paid. Um, we have a new business coming in, so we're a very privileged uh, position. So we don't need short-term help from the government, unlike some sectors and some industries. Long-term, I think my main requirement from the Alaman government is that it's, and indeed most governments we come into contact with, is that they are stable, consistent and clear in what they're planning to do. So I'm not looking for any special favours or anything, but I need to know the direction of travel for these governments so we can plan accordingly, so advisors can plan and customers can plan. So it's chopping and changing, short-term fixes are difficult to, to um, manage. So I'm looking for clarity and consistency really from all governments. No doubt one factor is tax. There is a common assumption around the world that tax levels will rise. That may be the case, difficult to tell at the moment. 
and if that happens, uh, A, there might be less disposable income around, but I'm almost certain what it will do is it means that those who are internationally mobile will plan their tax matters very carefully so that they can cope and advisors have a role to play in doing that effectively. So I don't want personally in a fraud company any special favours, but I want clarity and consistency. And finally, we, we've touched on this, or you've touched on this in some of your answers, but is there anything in particular that um, RL360 has been doing to support your advisors through the, the lockdown so far and, and you plan to be doing more of moving forward? I think the core offering for us to advisors, as I've mentioned before, was getting a target operating model that worked for them, for the advisors and their clients in these rather difficult times. Uh, I think we did that. I'm sure we made a couple of mistakes along the way, but basically we have an effective, stable operating environment with 350 people working from home. Extraordinary, really, when I think about it. And I think that's the basic thing that advisors need for us to work effectively. But we also need to help them grow their business. They can't just sit there sort of, uh, going around with existing business all the time so to grow their business they need to know they're in touch with the world uh, and that they are able to uh, communicate to their clients about what's going on and what's changing and so for us uh, the big difference between what i call the process side of what we offer advisors to the relationship side has been um, about carrying on with relationship management education about fund management about uh, tax and trust matters, technical matters, of which our biggest new uh, friend has been Zoom. We're doing eight, nine officially sanctioned Zoom calls a week to advisors, sometimes up to 100 advisors at a time, on tax, technical, fund manager conversations. Uh, and advisors are signing up in a way uh, because they're really keen to carry on knowledge gathering. So I, I would say something we've been particularly effective at is the relationship, keeping the relationship going, uh, even though everybody's stuck at home. And technology has made that uh, much easier than it might have been five years ago. Zoom is our new friend. I mean, who thought that Neil Chadwick would be doing technical training to 100 advisors from his bedroom? You know, I mean, and he's doing several a week. <laughs> it's, uh, it's extraordinary. We do find ourselves in utterly extraordinary times. and. Uh... With the news from the Chancellor this morning that we're going to have the further scheme extended until mm. October, it doesn't look like that's going to change anytime soon. But as you say, the, the short term and the long term, at least for the life insurance sector, is looking relatively sanguine, or at least you're sanguine about it. Um, medium term time will tell, and we will find out as and when that plays out. But uh, David, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Um, Stay safe. Thank you. And last word, if I may, to advisors out there that watch this video. Uh, if, if you want help, if you want to have a conversation, just contact your normal relationship manager. They're there to help. We're there to help. If you need us, just get in touch. And uh, thank you for your time.